Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. And tonight's program is Joshua Tree National Park Ranger Talk with live streaming uh, park ranger from Joshua Tree in Southern California. We are thrilled to, to be there and to see the scenery behind her. And this month is a special month because we are celebrating a novel idea. Um, but this is the 18th year of a novel idea and uh, the second during a pandemic. And this year we are celebrating the other Americans. So this whole month of April, we're going to be exploring different aspects of the book. And the reason we're talking to Joshua Tree National Park Park Rangers, I love it. The reason we're talking to them is because the book is set in um, Joshua Tree and alongside of it. And, and we would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors for making this possible. And everyone who's read the book, I wanna thank you because this is why we do it, is for the community and it, that's, that's why we're the most successful program in the state of Oregon. So, uh, so please, without further ado, our park ranger, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Jane, and I'm a park ranger at Joshua Tree National Park. My usual job here is um, taking students on field trips. So we have a lot of local communities, as you know, if you read the book, we have several local communities that are just um, regular towns where you live. And then they have um, elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. And so in a usual year, um, you know, five days a week, I am meeting a big yellow school bus and taking kids uh, to different places in the park so they can, they can learn about Joshua Tree National Park. This year, last year, wherever we are, uh, we have been doing a lot of virtual learning. So that's what we're going to do together tonight. Um, we're going to do we're going to do more or less our program, our general desert program about plants and animals. Um, and so just to get everybody on the same page geographically, I'm showing a map of the state of California. And on this map, uh, there's a bunch of green blobs. <laughs> Those green blobs are all national parks. So in California, we're lucky we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, this one kind of in the middle of the state is a really popular one. That's Yosemite National Park. Uh, wiggle your fingers at me if you have your video up, if you have been to Yosemite National Park. Hey, look. Okay, this one over here, one of my favorite ones. This is Death Valley National Park. Touch your head if you've been to Death Valley. Anybody? Oh, all right. Okay. This one over here is Mojave National Preserve. This is a really cool park, but not very many people go there. Show us two fingers if you've been to Mojave National Preserve. <gasps> way to go, wow, <laughs> cool park. Okay, and then me, I'm way down here at the bottom. This green blob uh, is Joshua Tree National Park. I'm about two and a half hours east of the city of Los Angeles and about two and a half hours north of the city of San Diego. Um, so we have a lot of visitors that come from Southern California. I must apologize for my light, everyone. I'm gonna take you off the stand for a second. It's sunset in the Mojave Desert. I just don't want you to miss it. Um, so we're gonna get uh, some last looks at the sun setting here. Um, we're in a campground right now. This is Black Rock Camp campground and we have a little building here that's our office and also a campground bathroom uh, and that happens to have a wi-fi <laughs> antenna on the top so that's where we are and we're going to take advantage of this last light um, here in black rock to check out some plants and animals so usually how we get started on our program is um, to think about how important water is in to all life so we'll just do a little test here for life in your home, wherever you are. Um, if you could just take your tongue and move it around in your mouth. <laughs> Hopefully it feels kind of wet in there. <laughs> water is, oh yeah, some people are thirsty just thinking about it. Uh, water is really foundational for life. And in deserts, um, it's, it's a rare thing. So here in the Mojave Desert, we get a little less usually than five inches of moisture of rain or snow per year. 
the past few years, we've gotten more than average snow, especially in the winter. So we've had these beautiful, you've probably seen these super blooms. Um, the last, the last 12 months have been very dry here. So my, my phone kind of reminds me of a picture that I've taken like a year ago. It'll be like a year ago on this day, it looked like this outside. And it keeps showing me all these pictures from a year ago in, in March and April that are just um, so green. And here this year, 2021, um, I feel very lucky to show you just this <laughs> that is growing outside the office. So today as we're, uh, as we're walking around, we're gonna be noticing how the plants and animals are coping with how dry it is. Um, we have a few plants that grow around here that are succulents. These are plants that store water inside themselves. Um, and one of them is our namesake plant, the Joshua tree. So we're gonna hike up to the Joshua tree and take a close look at it. Um, Joshua trees grow throughout the Mojave Desert. So this is not the only place they grow. We're actually at the very Southern end of their range here. You'll find Joshua trees up through um, central Nevada and Utah. Um, and they, uh, they are really unique looking plant. We'll kind of look around and see a few of them here. And I, I do apologize if my internet gets a little laggy on the hill. I try to go slow and it can catch up to me. Um, one of the special things about Joshua trees that help them cope with how dry it is here is the shape of their leaves. Um, so I'm looking up at this Joshua tree's leaves right now, but there happens to be a little baby Joshua tree growing right at the base of this big one. So we can take a close up look at its leaves. <laughs> this um, baby Joshua tree is likely a, what we call a pup. So it's a little offshoot of this bigger plant. What I want you to notice is how the leaves are sort of gutter shaped. And I actually will invite you all <laughs> to make this shape of leaf. Um, if you take both your hands, it's kind of going to be a directions following test because I only have one hand right now. Take both your hands and put them um, together kind of in front of you with your pinkies touching and your palms facing you. Perfect. Now pull your elbows together, really glue your forearms together. And then put your elbows against your body, kind of by your belly button. Okay, perfect, beautiful, you guys are doing great. You all have one Joshua tree leaf on your body right now. You can probably imagine if it was raining or say somebody came by and dumped some water on your hands, any water that landed on your leaf would go right down your pants, right? <laughs> If you made a good shaped Joshua tree leaf, you made a water collecting device. These uh, plants live in really sandy soils. So whenever it rains here, uh, the water that goes into the sand moves really quickly through the grains of sand. We get these big flash floods. And then when it's done raining and the sun comes out, uh, the ground dries really quickly because it's just sand, there's no shade. So Joshua trees want to gather as much water as they can. And in order to do that, they gather it not just through their roots, but through their leaves as well. Look at all those leaves. They're just water capturing mechanisms. And then you can probably notice the outside of the Joshua tree is kind of um, this shaggy, hairy consistency. <laughs> These are all of the old dead leaves. Um, once a Joshua tree's leaves dry out, they don't fall onto the ground. They just fold down, they cover the trunk, and this makes some shade for the plant. So all summer long, when it's 110 degrees out here, if we could um, snuggle a thermometer underneath this shaggy coating, we find it's maybe 10 uh, to 12 degrees cooler in the shade underneath there. So Joshua trees always have water inside of them, um, and that's how they're able to stay green <laughs> year round. Just like another common desert plant that you probably have where you live too. Ranger, Ranger, did we yeah. just see a desert tortoise? <laughs> oh, quick spotting. Oh my goodness, right there. I can't believe ah! it. Wow. Let's go check it out. I can't believe you noticed that. It's just the light is perfect. Wow, desert tortoises are such cool animals. 
they're actually on the endangered species list. There's not very many of them left in the wild. Um, so it's super special that we get to see this one today. <laughs> um, the desert tortoises have lived in the Mojave Desert probably since the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. Um, some of the things that help them survive are similar to the Joshua trees, they store water inside themselves. So a, a desert tortoise has a special bladder that helps it reabsorb moisture from its body. So usually in the end of summer, like in August or September, we get big rains. Um, and <laughs> when it rains, the tortoises will come out and they'll take a big drink from the puddles. They'll drink and then they'll pee a whole bunch and then they'll drink and then they'll pee a whole bunch and then they'll take one more big drink and that's it. They don't take any more drinks again for like another year. <laughs> so they store that water in, in their bladders and use the same, they just recycle it. One of the things that helps them do this is they spend most of their time underground in burrows. So they're not usually out moving around. They're on the surface, just maybe 10% of their, of their lives. Uh, so usually they're underground sleeping in burrows. This should be the time of year that they're out. Um, but when they come out, they're looking for wildflowers to eat. And this year, uh oh, <laughs> we don't have too many wildflowers growing. Um, desert tortoises are really hardy animals. I think they will find some food to eat this year. Um, and then they'll just go back underground and they'll sleep all, all summer. So hopefully they won't need too much food to sustain themselves. They love to eat um, flowers from cactus. They love to eat wildflowers. We're walking by a Mojave yucca, which is a close relative to the Joshua tree. You can probably notice those really um, gutter shaped leaves on the Mojave yuccas as well. Most of the plants that we're walking by here are not able to store water inside of them. <laughs> They're not like uh, a cactus or a Joshua tree. Most of the bushes that grow here are at dormant when there's not enough moisture to support them. So all of these kind of dead looking bushes that you see, they're not really dead, they're just sleeping. There's not been enough rain for them to, to burst out with their leaves the way they usually would in spring. So they haven't died, they're just resting, they're just waiting for when conditions will be right um, for them to bloom. Oh, I was hearing this rustling in this cactus. You guys wanna see what I found? Is that a choice? Whoa. Yeah, it's a choya, and in it is a cactus wren. So a cactus wren is a bird that builds its nest in choya, um, and they, they make this really um, pretty obnoxious kind of call. <laughs> they're, quite, <laughs> they're quite bossy birds. They build their nest in choya, because it helps to defend their eggs from animals that want to eat them, like snakes. So we do have several species of snakes that live in the Mojave Desert. This time of day is pretty chilly for most of our reptiles. It's surprising that we saw that tortoise out. <laughs> most of the time you will see snakes uh, during the warmer periods of the day, they're out basking, um, they're laying, in the open, so they're pretty easy to spot, especially our rattlesnakes um, will usually, they sense vibrations in the ground when they feel people walking. So usually they'll let you know, they'll do a big rattle um, whenever you start to get close to them and then you can easily avoid them. Um, here, I'm, I just noticed there's another animal over here. This is probably another reason there's no snakes out. <laughs> over here, we have a road runner and road runners love to eat rattlesnakes. Roadrunners will actually eat almost anything that's smaller than them. <laughs> They'll eat rattlesnakes or tarantulas, scorpions, lizards. <laughs> They're really, um, really fast, ferocious hunters. Um, so a roadrunner, sometimes people wonder if a roadrunner eats a rattlesnake, will it get sick from the rattlesnake's venom? Uh, and the, <laughs> the way that they usually will grab a rattlesnake is right behind its head. So the snake can't bite them. They kind of smash it against the ground. And then they actually swallow it kind of like you're slurping a spaghetti noodle. 
<laughs> so they swallow it head first. Um, and sometimes you'll see them kind of running around with half of the snake hanging out of their mouth. They're not, they're not in any danger. They're just slowly swallowing their, their lunch. When the snake goes into their belly, it, it's not dangerous to them. Um, so the venom is only really dangerous if it's injected. Kind of like, you know, if you eat applesauce, it goes in your belly, you're, you're full, you're happy. If somebody gave you like a shot of applesauce in the arm, <laughs> it would not feel very good. So the, the rattlesnake venom is not dangerous unless it's injected. Oh, I wish you guys could smell the smell of this campground right now. It's really overpoweringly like a mixture of campfire and sunscreen. <laughs> Oh, there's another animal over here. Wow, this is a pretty rare animal to see. These guys are really shy. We're going to get a little closer. Of course, we want to give wild animals plenty of space, but this one's holding really still. Here we have a very sweet looking desert gray fox. We have two species of fox that live in Joshua Tree National Park. We have gray fox and we have kit fox. Right now, uh, there's a crisis for our foxes. Um, we have a, a virus that's spreading through the canine population and it started with foxes um, and the biologists predict that it'll probably spread to coyotes. Um, so that's one of the reasons that at Joshua Tree National Park um, and other, other places that, that are wild animals homes, you'll see different regulations regarding pets. At Joshua Tree National Park, we don't allow any pets on trails. Um, there's just <laughs> so much development in Southern California. There are only a few places that remain wild for these animals. And we're trying to do our best um, to, keep, to keep their homes protected. So uh, it's very lucky that we got to see a fox tonight. <laughs> they're, they're facing new challenges. Hey, Ranger. Oh, yeah, oh, go ahead. I, there were two questions regarding temperature. What is the temperature today? What was the high of today? Um, thank you for asking. I was just checking in my car on the way here. It was 82 degrees when I arrived to Black Rock Canyon, but now that the sun has set, it feels much cooler. Um, so I would guess probably by, by now it's already like in the low 70s, probably dropping into the 60s already. Traffic. And what are the high and low temperatures of Joshua Tree in the winter versus the summer? So in the winter, it gets pretty cold up here at Black Rock Canyon. We're at like 3,800 3, feet above sea level. So it is often freezing, you know, in the high 20s overnight. And then during the daytime, it'll be, you know, in the 50s. In the summer, it gets quite warm. <laughs> normal, it's normal for the high to be maybe just over 100, maybe like 102 to 105. Um, and in the summer, often we think about deserts as being really hot during the day and really cold at night. But in the summer, we are so far south here that in the summer, often it will stay, it will stay in the upper 80s, well past like 9 p.m. So um, for people who are visiting the park in the summertime, you know, it's nice to stargaze after the sun has set, but you can expect it to stay quite, quite warm. Mm -hmm. um, oh, let me check my my time here. <laughs> Thank you. I want to make sure that I leave a lot of time for questions at the end. So I just sure. want to make sure I'm not talking over. I did want to show you one of my very favorite animals is right here. Let me flip you around so you can see it. Oh, look at this one. Does anybody know? Wiggle your fingers at me if you know this animal. Have you seen this before? Ooh, they're looking carefully. We've stumped them. This is the ringtail cat. It's a relative of raccoons. Um, it gets the name cat because apparently during the early 1900s um, when there were a lot of miners in the park, these animals were quite sociable and miners liked having them around their cabins because they do eat um, small, what we consider probably pests. So they'll eat little mice, they eat scorpions, they eat tarantulas. Um, and if you're hiking and you leave your backpack on the ground, they will crawl into it and eat your, your trail mix. Um, they should be nocturnal. You see those big eyes, an indicator that an animal likes to come out at nighttime. Um, but they will come out during the daytime. I've seen, <laughs> I've heard of people seeing them in the middle of the day. And also if you're driving at night, if you're crossing the road, you're likely to see a ringtail cat. Often we will have people come to the visitor center and ask if we have lemurs in this park. 
<laughs> because they see that long black and white striped tail. We do not in fact have lemurs here, but ring tail cats are pretty, pretty close approximation. <laughs> okay, so we went on a little tour to see some critters. Uh, I want to mention some strategies that animals use uh, to, to cope with the conditions here. We already talked about being nocturnal, um, waiting until the sun has <laughs> gone down to come out and start gathering food. Um, for lots of these creatures, kind of like the desert tortoise, their main survival strategy is to minimize activity, um, which I think can be a lesson for a lot of us. <laughs> We have a lot of stress in our lives. Maybe we're just trying to do too many things. So for, for lots of desert animals all day long, they are resting, they are sleeping, they are conserving their resources. Um, and I think for, <laughs> for me, there's definitely a lesson in that, um, especially over the past year. Another way that um, desert animals cope with how dry it is, is they're pretty efficient at water use. Um, so most desert animals, a lot of the animals that we met uh, on our little walk here do not drink liquid water. They just don't have an opportunity to drink liquid water. They don't encounter it in the environment. There's no rivers here. There's no lakes. There are some seeps and springs, but they can be very temporal. So um, a bighorn sheep, for example, might visit a spring to get a drink of water. Bighorn sheep are pretty big mammals. They do need to drink liquid water to produce enough milk for their babies. Um, but that spring might dry up, you know, within a week or two weeks. So they have to travel and find another water source. So most desert animals get the water they need from the food that they eat. This is kind of like, you know, if we're really hot, we've been outside, we're thirsty. If we eat some orange slices or eat some grapes, we will feel less thirsty because we're able to get some of the water that we need from the food that we eat. <laughs> desert animals, especially um, lots of lizards, roadrunners, a lot of birds, like our owls. They are burrowing owls, our, our elf owls. Um, <laughs> they don't drink liquid water. You can put a dish of water out and they, they wouldn't really know what to do with it because they are so efficient at, at getting all the water they need from the food that they eat. In a year like this year, when it's been really dry, uh, that, that gets tougher um, because the food that <laughs> the herbivores are eating does not have very much water in it to, to begin with. Um, deserts are a place that scientists are really interested in studying as we learn more about climate change models, because deserts are places where animals and plants are already kind of living at the edge of extremes. So uh, especially in the Mojave Desert, we had a pretty long drought, a five-year drought um, from like 2013 until 2018. Um, so scientists were really interested in studying, you know, some animals move some animals <laughs> change their behavior and some animals or plants die uh, when conditions become too extreme. So studying the plants and animals that live in the desert and how they're coping with a hotter or drier climate than other places can be informative for, for scientists predicting, trying to make predictions about um, as, as the planet continues to become a little warmer and a little drier. Okay, let me see. Laurel, what did I miss in the chat? I haven't, <laughs> I've not been oh, monitoring at all. Well, one of them was um, kind of uh, carrying on with what you're talking about uh, with climate changes. Is there concern about climate change with Joshua trees? And what is their typical lifespan? Yeah, great question. So we, we do not know um, how old any given Joshua tree is they have wildly variable growth rates. So maybe one will grow three inches in one year and then not grow at all for the next 10 years. Maybe the one next to it will grow one inch every year consistently. Um, funnily enough, the best way we have to age Joshua trees is people sending us historical photographs. People will send us pictures like, oh, my Aunt Betty visited Joshua Tree in 1957. And we look at the picture and we're like, oh, those rocks in the background, she was at Hidden Valley. We'll take the picture, we'll hold it up. We'll figure out what Joshua trees are in the picture of Betty and what Joshua trees are on the surface now. And that's how we're, we're able to estimate that. They probably don't live to be more than maybe 150, maybe 200 years old. They're certainly not very long lived plants. Um, and that's interesting given that most desert plants, that creosote bush, these junipers, even this black brush, can live to be hundreds, easily 500 years old. 
desert plants are generally very slow growing with the pace of resources that are available to them. And they grow, they, they stay alive for a long time because it's so tough to get started. I mean, a desert plant just starting from a seed in a dry condition, they're really vulnerable. It's really hard when you're, when you're small. Um, so they grow very slowly, most desert plants, um, and for a long time. Joshua trees, we saw that, that pup coming up from the base earlier. That might be one of their strategies that instead of, you know, being alive for a long time, they send up a new pup. So some Josh trees, I'm, like I'm looking at a few here that just have, they're surrounded by like maybe five or six smaller Joshua trees that are part of that, that larger plant compost or driving by. So waving at everybody. Um, so when it comes to um, climate change, that is one thing that scientists are studying is recruitment. So we're seeing this coping skill of Joshua trees of sending up these new pups from the roots those pups are clones. They're genetically identical to that larger Joshua tree. What we really want to see is brand new baby Joshua trees growing from seed because a seed means that there's information from two plants, right? Uh, it's springtime. The Joshua trees are flowering now. This is what their flowers look like. A little moth goes in and pollinates the flowers with pollen from uh, another Joshua tree and then a fruit will form and the fruit has seeds inside of it. So a uh, Joshua tree growing from one of those seeds would be genetically unique from each of its parents. And the more genetic diversity we have in the population, the more resilient we would expect that population to be. So the short answer is we don't know, <laughs> but the, the thing that scientists are really interested in looking at is the proportion of Joshua trees that are reproducing via cloning, via these pups that come up from the base, versus the, the percentage of, jo of Joshua trees that are brand new from a seed. And again, it's hard to be, I mean, I have sprouted Joshua tree seeds. I'm almost always sprouting Joshua tree seeds just in a paper towel in my, in my windowsill, but to plant them and to get them to actually grow. I mean, they're like a, one blade of grass. I don't understand how that little one <laughs> that's attached to the big one hasn't been eaten by rabbits. Rabbits eat them in my yard all the time. So um, that's the, the big scientific question right now. And we, we, are, um, we have established some, they call it refugia, some areas where Joshua tree populations seem like they will be successful in the future. And those areas are top priority for us when it comes to fire, wildfire um, prevention. So there's a huge wildfire last year in Mojave National Preserve, the Dome Fire um, that burned hundreds of acres of Joshua tree woodland. That will be very informative <laughs> to scientists how those areas respond here at Joshua Tree National Park. They have, you know, they have maps. So if there's a wildfire that breaks out here, resources are going to be sent to areas where the forest of Joshua trees are most diverse, where they're estimated to be most likely to survive in the future. That was a really long answer. Sorry. <laughs> you guys are bored to death. Who else has a question? <laughs> Okay, climate change, wildfire. wildfires was one of the other questions that someone had is that you guys have issues with that. Is that a natural thing that happens there? Great question. No, it's not a natural thing that happens here. When I first started working here in 2013, so that's not that long ago, in between all these plants would be just open sand. We used to do like activities with the kids. We would just walk through the desert. We'd have them spread out we can't do those activities anymore because now growing between all of the plants are these invasive grasses. Remember I said we had a really dry year this year. The bushes are all just staying asleep. They're not doing anything. This cheat grass is growing everywhere. <laughs> so uh, we have a number of grass species. We have cheat grass. Oh, look, there's also red brome in here. The whole, wow, make sure there's shismus. Here's another one right here. I have a little bouquet for you guys. Uh, so these invasive grasses are here because of agriculture to the south. So usually this, the soils would not be rich enough to support all these grasses, but we have a lot of agriculture in the Imperial Valley and they use fertilizers and the fertilizers become airborne and the nitrogen from the fertilizers has been deposited here in Joshua Tree National Park, leading to a huge explosion of invasive grasses. So these guys are just in between every bush. It's crazy to think about all the things like I used to be able to do just walking through the desert. And now I can't because my shoes get just full of these little, I'm sure you've had these in your shoes before. They're everywhere. You probably have them where you live too. Um, so the grasses 
are a big threat because that's how wildfires spread. Historically, I mean, if a Josh tree gets hit by lightning, okay, it's going to catch on fire and fall over and maybe catch a few more bushes on fire, but there's like just bare sand between them. So the fire is not going to spread. Um, fire is not a natural part of this ecosystem. The plants here are not really, uh, they're not like, you know, those pine cones that need fire to, to regenerate. Um, there is an area in the park that burned, oh gosh, it probably burned 25, 30 years ago. And most of the Josh trees there have been just skeletal, just burned shells of their former selves. Um, but lately I have noticed some little regrowth, just a little bit. Um, so maybe, you know, after a longer period of time, they start to recover. There's definitely a lot of questions that the dome fire, the area in Mojave National Preserve that burned last year um, is going to be a big study opportunity. It's tragic. It was a huge fire. Um, but I think we're going to learn, learn a lot uh, seeing what happens next. And we, well, we definitely have cheatgrass and experience with wildfires here. So that's sad to hear. Um, I do have two, there's two kind of different geology questions. One, quicksand. Is it there? How to avoid it? Two, <laughs> the big boulders. What is with them? Why those giant round boulders? What is with explain? them? Um, yes. <laughs> so quicksand, we do not have here because we don't have enough water. So quicksand is when there's like a equal proportion of water in the sand. And so that gives it that like jelly consistency, like the sand particles are suspended in exactly enough water to create that suction. So there's no quicksand here. We always joke with the kids walking through the wash. There's only slow sand, it's hard work. <laughs> um, the boulders, okay, Joshua Tree National Park is pretty famous for these kind of like peanut butter colored rounded boulders. You can pull up a new tab and, and Google it. I'm here at Black Rock. This campground is named Black Rock because the rocks here, none of which are right here, sadly, are a dark color. They're metamorphic rock called Pinto Nice, and they're like 1.8 billion years old, super old. Um, those lighter brown kind of kind of light colored rocks that you see in all the pictures, there's like one that's shaped like a skull that's very famous. Um, yeah, there's like big blobby boulders. Those rocks are, are very new, only like 75 million years old. And they formed deep underground um, when the, so we're on the North American plate right here. What, the, what, what plate are you guys on? Are you on the North American plate? Or are you on the Pacific? <laughs> we don't know. Okay, I, well. It's like a real big toss up because I know. Oh, we're you right just right jumped from edge. one to the other? You're right on the edge? Okay, me too. I'm busy my geology in front of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the San Andreas Fault divides the, the North American plate where I am from the Pacific plate where Los Angeles is. Before those two plates, the North American plate and the Pacific plate were together, there was another one called the Farallon or Farallon plate, which got subducted. It got sucked underneath the North American plate. And underneath the North American plate is really hot in the Earth's mantle. So the Farallon plate, the Farallon plate melted and uh, it got all mixed up in the Earth's mantle and then uplift happened and that's where we got those boulders. <laughs> so they're, they're the, the recycled remains of a, a continental plate that existed between the North American plate and the Pacific plate, oh, you know, like one-ish billion years ago. <laughs> That was the short answer. Do look at pictures of those rocks, though. They're they're beautiful. I'm sorry, we don't have any here to show you. <laughs> and they do look startling when you drive through. There's this just out of the desert. There's these huge, beautiful, strange rocks. And um, so, yes, I encourage everyone to Google that one. I had one person that was uh, very detailed that noticed that the flowers that you showed, the Joshua tree flowers, they looked like yucca. Flowers, are they related? Yeah, Joshua trees and yuccas are very closely related. They're both in the yucca family. Joshua tree's scientific name is yucca brevifolia, which means short leafed yucca. And compared to like Mojave yuccas uh, or other species of yucca, they do have much shorter leaves. So the other species of yucca, we saw it up there with those really defined gutter shaped leaves. That's yucca shadigara. I don't know what shadigara means. I should probably look that up. Um, but they have very similar flowers and they are pollinated by a single species of moth, the yucca moth. 
Um, the Joshua trees and the yuccas and the moths have a symbiotic relationship. So the moth um, goes into the flowers. It's an intentional pollination. It's not like a bee just like bumbling by could get into those flowers. So the moth has to go deep into the flowers to like deposit a ball of pollen way deep in there. And then she lays her eggs. So when the fruit forms, the Josh tree fruit, it's not it's sweet. I'm using the word fruit botanically, not delicious. Um, when the, the fruit forms with all seeds inside of it, the yucca moth larvae hatch inside and they eat their way out of the fruit and then go into the soil to pupate. Um, so they don't eat all of the seeds and you know sometimes they don't hatch. So there's plenty of Joshua tree seeds in a fruit. Sometimes if you smash them open, you'll see the little larvae in there. They're just chomping away at the, the seeds. So that's another complication. You know, there's one, one pollinator <laughs> for one species. If something happens to the Joshua trees or if something happens to the moth, it's a very delicate balance that we're just hanging in here, all of us together. The scary stories. You didn't know you were coming to Sarah Jane Horror Hour. I, <laughs> I held a pollinating talk the other day. So yeah, there's a theme here. The pollinators are very important. Um, do you guys have javelina or Mexican wolf, jaguar, or big cats there? We do have mountain lions here, and we have bobcats. Um, we'll get the occasional black bear that will wander down from the San Bernardino Mountains. There's not enough food here for bears. They're always lost. It's very sad when they come here. <laughs> There's nothing for them to eat. Um, we don't have javelinas or jaguars. Those animals need a little bit more water. So you'll find them in the Sonoran Desert, uh, which does have more uh, stable year-round water sources. We had another Joshua tree question. Why is it called a Joshua tree? Oh, thank you for asking that. I was so excited in the beginning. I totally forgot to say. Um, I'm going to chat this and then I think, Laurel, you'll have to um, send it out to the group because I don't think I can I can chat it to everyone. So um, the Native American, there have been Native Americans living in this area for at least that we know of 10,000 years. So that's pretty impressive. Um, the most recent groups that we have here are the Kawea, the Chimawavi, the Mojave, and the Serrano. And all of the people who have lived here over the ages have had their own names for this plant. <laughs> so um, I'm putting the Kawea word in the chat. It's umichawa, or I've also heard it pronounced umich. Uh, that's the Kawea word for this plant. Um, the, the name Joshua tree comes from some Mormon pioneers. They had, you know, crossed the Rocky Mountains. They were looking for uh, a new place to live. And the first that they ever saw one of these plants was in Utah. And they saw it, you know, at a distance. And they so it had a single trunk and then it had two, you know, branches outstretched. And it reminded them of the Bible story of Joshua. And I guess in the story, Joshua welcomes travelers to their new home. Um, so they called it the Joshua tree. And that name just kind of caught on. Um, there's also names like the yucca tree or the tree yucca. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we always invite children to make up their own name for the Joshua tree. Usually if there's a Joshua in the class, then everyone just makes it their own name, like the Ashley tree, the Stephanie tree, the Mackenzie tree. But you can also think of your own creative name for it. The scientific name, Yucca brevifolia, just uh, is an indicative of those, those short leaves. Okay, and then we did have a question on if there were indigenous uses for the Joshua tree, like using a basketry for their kind of bark like substance or medicinal uses. Sure. The yuccas, their relatives, yucca shadigara, has a ton of uses. They make baskets out of the leaves. Um, they fry the flowers and eat them. The roots can be used to make a soap. The Joshua trees not so much. <laughs> There's the only use that we know of maybe is that they would take those little dried out leaves and use them as like a paintbrush. They're just so short and brittle. The longer yucca leaves, there's like a fiber they can make like a rope out of Joshua trees. We often joke that the reason we still have them here is because they are useless to anyone. You know, if we found a way to consume them, we probably would have chopped them all down in the early 1900s, but they are, uh, yeah, they, they have, they're worthless. So they're still here. 
They are cute, and I I personally think that's what's on the book. It, to me, that looks like yucca trees on the front. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's cool. Did you guys finish the book? Wasn't it so good? I I did, of course. I mean, did everyone else? I hope everyone else gets no a chance spoilers. to read it and join. It, it was twisty. I <laughs> thought that I knew what was going to happen, and I did not know what, what happened. So. Stick it with it mystery. if you're in there. It was one of the first mysteries, I think, that we've had. And so now we had one question on just how the park is doing right now in the face of COVID. And, you know, we've heard it's been really busy down there. Um, and how are, yeah, I guess just how is it doing? I know Crater Lake over here has had some issues with just a, being totally overwhelmed. Have you guys had the same kind of issue? Yeah. Yeah, can relate. So Joshua Tree's visitation just was already spiking before the pandemic hit. Um, the graph of visitation was just, when I started in 2013, we had a, a little less than a million visitors in a year. And then it was a million and a half and then 2 million and then two and a half. And then we almost hit three in 2019. So that's wild. And the infrastructure here is just not set up to accommodate the demand. Um, so this park was first created as a national monument in 1936, and then we became a national park with Death Valley and Mojave um, in 1996. And you know we have campgrounds, we have trails. It's a fun place to go, but we are definitely not like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon. There's no hotels in the park. There's no gas stations. There's no restaurants. Um, it's a very primitive park, um, and right now we are really struggling to accommodate all of the visitors that want to come and enjoy the park. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Like the point of having national parks is for visitors to be able to enjoy them the way that they've always been. So it's our job to, you know, protect the Joshua trees and have all the rock formations so people can come, but all the people that want to come have to have a place to park. So then are we supposed to, you know, do we mow down the Joshua trees to make more parking lots? The whole point was to have all the Joshua trees for them to see. Um, so <laughs> we are, working hard. We have tried a shuttle system. We are going to, um, we have just started online. You can buy your pass online now. That's kind of sped up stuff. Our entrance station is just one, it's just one booth. There's no lanes. There's no, like, if you already have a pass go over here, it's just one booth with a ranger inside it that has to take your money, <laughs> bring it through the register. And the line will just be a mile and a half and it's neighborhoods. It's the town. I mean, it's the, the cabin. That, that her dad had is probably right off Park Boulevard. Like that road that snakes up to, to the, the entrance station is just people's houses and they live there. So, you know, those people are just trying to get their kids to daycare and they try to leave the house and it's just a line of cars waiting to get into the park. So yes, we are in conclusion, we are overwhelmed with visitors and working hard to try to find ways to, to accommodate everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of people, locals uh, to Central Oregon would recognize that in Smith Rock or Cascade Lakes Highway. Uh, we have very similar issues of our outdoors being loved a lot. Um, so we, if we were to visit <laughs> someday in the future, um, a few years ago, it was, I don't remember how many years ago, it was like super bloom, like everywhere, especially in Death Valley. Did you guys experience that? And what is the best time to come for cactus blooms? Yeah, um, we did have a super bloom two years ago. And honestly, last year, the park was closed in March and April because of COVID. And we, the staff was doing surveying work inside the park. And it was, I don't know that it was a super bloom technically, but to see the park, you know, without anybody, you know, having pulled off and parked on all the shoulders where all the poppies grow was really outstanding. Um, so it's difficult to predict a super bloom. Sometimes scientists get surprised. Usually by the middle of February, we, we know whether or not there's going to be a super bloom. Um, cactus are usually a little later. So we get little stuff that starts popping up mid-March generally. And then the cactus, even now I can see buds that are still, you know, about two weeks away from actually bursting on the cactus. So towards the middle of April is when you'll find more cactus blooms. The Joshua trees have, at least in Black Rock, <laughs> the Joshua trees are blooming now, usually mid-March to mid-April is, is a good time to see those. And you've worked there for 
you know, several years now, almost eight years. What is your favorite part about working there? Oh man, it's the best. I, one of the real um, pluses about my job here is that this park is lovely to visit during the season that students are in school. Um, so we're able to take kids out hiking on field trips almost all school year at the the beginning of September and towards the end of April it, it starts to get too hot to really be enjoyable for for kids um but I love that you know kids are able to get outside they often like will get off the bus they come from you know cities in the Coachella Valley Palm Springs Palm Desert they don't spend a lot of time away from those urban areas so they just get off the bus and they're like they always say ah oh, it's so fresh <laughs> all the fresh air. It's very sweet. So I love working with kids and I love being outside and it's nice that I get to work someplace where those things come together. Oh, wonderful. And we have one of our uh, attendees who will be there next week. They want to know how they can be the best visitors and if you have any advice on stargazing. Yes, next week should be beautiful for stargazing, right? Um, It's it's getting, it's staying light later. So you'll have to, you know, you'll have to stay up a little later to see the stars, but it should be really beautiful. Um, my favorite place to send people for stargazing is called Echo T. Echo, like Echo. Echo T is a big parking area. It's surrounded by those um, really rounded boulders and there's Joshua trees. So if you have a fancy camera, you can do one of those cool photos with the silhouette of the Joshua tree and the boulders and the Milky Way in the background. Um, to be a good visitor this time of year, you just really need to be flexible. You know, a lot of people come and they want to hike Hidden Valley and Barker Dam and Arch Rock and Keysview. <laughs> it's likely that the parking areas at those places are, are going to be full. And if you encounter a full parking area, of course, we all know you just have to drive on to the next parking area. There's a lot of roadside parking available in this park. Um, you just have to make sure you can safely get all four tires off the road without crushing any plants and then you can really go exploring here at Joshua Tree you don't have to be on a trail you're not going to hurt the sand by walking on it so wear your gaiters so you don't get those cheat grass spines in your shoes and you can kind of forge out and go climbing on the rocks it's going to be it's going to be a really beautiful time to visit so pack your patience There'll be a lot of other people trying to enjoy it too but there's plenty this is a huge national park there's plenty of space for all of us um, if we just we just have to share <laughs> Now, in the in the book, when Nora and Jeremy go on a hike at night, and she, you know, I don't want to give anything away. You've all read the book, right? And <laughs> she hurts herself, right? Did Did you know what hike they were on that they were illegally going into after dusk? <laughs> um, yes. So they go to a few places. I think they did the Chasm of Doom at one point. I don't recommend the Chasm of Doom, especially at nighttime. Its name is the Chasm of Doom say no more um the hike another hike they do in the book she talks about doing with her dad is willow hole that's a beautiful hike if you can get an early start you're going to park at the keys west backcountry board um and hike to willow hole that's that's a really lovely walk um yeah we've had a lot of search and rescue call outs unfortunately this spring i have my phone here just where if i talk about we've had a lot of calls and we probably won't have one tonight it's usually when i make plans to have dinner with someone that we go with. <laughs> so um, do let someone know where you're going, when you intend uh, to be back and check in with that person, have a buddy, have a plan. Um, so if you don't show up when you're meant to, we can go and go and fetch you. You're on the search and rescue team too, huh? <laughs> yeah, everybody's on the search and rescue team. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of work to go around. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll just have one more question for you. Um, the Joshua trees are obviously a major focal point of a lot of our chat. And are they specific to, you know, an altitude? Are they, you, you mentioned that they were in Utah when they were first seen. Yeah, and you'll still find them. So here at Joshua Tree, we're the very southern edge of the range. And indeed, they only grow in the northern half of this park. So people who enter the park from the south, they enter Joshua Tree National Park. There's a big sign, welcome to Joshua Tree. They have to drive for about an hour before they see their first Joshua Tree because they, as the climate is warming, um, they are moving north. Um, 
during the last ice age, the, re the range of the Joshua tree was determined by um, a prehistoric animal called the giant Shasta ground sloth. And I have one right over here. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have a giant Shasta ground sloth here. Um, this is a huge, like six foot tall sloth that would eat the fruits of the Joshua tree and then walk and it would poop out the seeds. Um, so as the last ice age faded out, um, those sloths were walking north and they were, they're like the Johnny Appleseed of Joshua trees. They're eating fruits and they're pooping seeds and they're, you know, over a course of 3000 years moving north. So the range of Joshua trees start here and goes up like through Las Vegas. You'll see them all around St. George, Utah. Once you get really into the Great Basin Desert, kind of like mid Utah, they, you don't, you don't find them anymore. It's just too cold for them. Um, but <laughs> we don't have any large animals that are eating Joshua tree fruits and pooping out whole seeds now. So this is really a relic, a relic landscape of, of a long ago <laughs> climatic condition. Mm. Is there, is there an altitude too, or is it? Yeah, they, you'll find them more or less, like they grow between like 3000 and 5000 feet. So like in the town of 29 Palms, no Joshua trees. It's like just under 3000 feet. Once you go, you know, 15 miles on the highway to Joshua tree, you start to see them. Once you go another five miles to Yucca Valley, they are everywhere. Mm. Well, we're glad that we have a place that they are and that they're safe. So thank you for protecting them, Ranger, and for protecting all the people that are visiting. And thank you for talking to us tonight. I know the daylight is leaving you and you're probably chilly. Uh, yeah, I gotta go collect all these animals, get them back in the barn for the night. <laughs> come on, come on, everybody. Thank you all so much for your attention. And we should all, let's wiggle our fingers to Laurel. Thank you, Laurel, for setting this up. We really appreciate it. It was so wonderful to get to see you all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Ranger. For you in the audience, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure seeing your faces and getting your questions. So thank you so much. Um, if you would like more information about a novel idea, our community reading program, and hopefully I didn't give away too much about <laughs> the book. I didn't. Um, you can get that book at the library and you can find out more and find more events that we have at DeschutesLibrary.org forward slash novel idea. I'll put that in the chat. And uh, all of our programs are free and virtual. And I am so glad you were able to join us tonight. There, this program was recorded. Your faces were not, but the ranger was. And if you want to share the link with other people, um, it'll be available on DeschutesLibrary.org uh, on the event calendar. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Mm -hmm.